Hi folks, welcome to my discussion on the sociological imagination. Uh, this is a repeat of an older version of the same video, so if you've watched the video titled The Sociological Imagination on my channel, this is the same material. I'm just updating a lot of my older, very, very scratchy videos from the past. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, this very important concept, the concept of the sociological imagination. Now, we have to kind of put things in context. Uh, C. Wright Mills, in his time, thought that sociological research had become quite problematic. He said that it had become the accumulation of facts for the purpose of facilitating administrative decisions. In other words, what he means is uh, sociological research had gotten away from trying to understand society in a theoretical sense and become more in tune with basic bean counting. In other words, let's go out, let's count these things, let's report these things back to the government, and let's let the government decide whether intervention needs to take place one way or another. Let's stop thinking about things in a deep, meaningful way, and instead let's just report data back to people who may or may not choose to intervene. So for Mills, this was a real disconnect from what he thought of as the whole idea of how we really should be approaching the study of society. And then in turn, uh, also about thinking about society in general, he wanted us to be uh, much more intellectual in the way we approached the scientific study of what's going on in the world around us. And what he said about this was that the difference between effective sociological thought and thought that fails uh, rests upon our ability to imagine. Now this is his idea, this idea of being able to consider the situations, the attitudes, beliefs, feelings, and experiences of people who might be different than us, and to put that in context with regard to sociological research. So he comes up with this concept called the sociological imagination. And what he says about that is to have a sociological imagination means that you have a quality of mind that allows you to grasp relationships between who you are, your own personal self and identity, your biography, and how you fit into the bigger picture of history. So that's kind of part one of his sociological imagination, if you will. Um, when he talks about society, he says, if you can grasp this kind of sociological imagination, understanding where you fit in the bigger picture, then this allows you to step out of your personal experiences and put yourself into a public place, the public world, to experience how other people are experiencing their world. And if we can do that, he said, it allows us to see the reality, the sociological reality of everyday life for not only ourselves, but also for others. So in my interpretation of Mill's work, what I understand the sociological imagination to be telling us is that all aspects of social life have meanings for us, for me, for you, uh, and those meanings that we have attached to life in general, and specifically, affect everybody in our society. So we do things on an individual level, on an individual basis, but as we do those things and we come in contact with other people in the world, in the groups around us, in our communities, all of those things that we have internalized are then externalized and they have impacts to other people around us, right? So meanings affect values, character, and behavior of everybody in a sociocultural system or a society. So I think what Mills was getting at there is that we have to consider that not only do we think we are right, we should also stop to consider whether other people might be right 
when their ideas, thoughts, and attitudes differ from our own. And in order to understand those differences, he felt that we should use sociology and the other social sciences to do research, to try and find out what these differences are and to try and reason them out so that we could better the position of most people in society. And he said in order to fulfill that mission, he felt we should, quote, avoid furthering the bureaucratization of reason and of discourse. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, what he means is the role of sociology is to bring reason to bear on human affairs. And to fulfill that, we needed to have intellectual thinkers who aren't interested in just reporting back uh, what we felt reality was based on numbers, but in fact, to be able to dig more deeply into what the data is perhaps telling us, to be able to situate ourselves as researchers in the social reality of others, and then be able to report back in the clearest terms possible what the reality of other people is. That, for Mills, is the promise of sociology, and that is the crux of the sociological imagination. And so in his own words, he says, I'm suggesting by addressing ourselves to issues and to troubles, and by formulating them as problems of science, we stand the best chance. And he believes that the only chance is to make reason democratically relevant to human affairs in a free society, and so to realize the classic values that underlie the promise of our studies. So that statement is from 1959, and I would argue to you that just as it was relevant then, it is relevant today. That we need to use science to understand what is going on in society, and if we do that, we are realizing the classic values of democracy. So Mills sets forth to um, incorporate his own ideas into the field of sociology about how we can do our work, our research. And he really does a solid job of conveying a sense of what it means to be an intellectual scientist, uh, a person who concentrates on the very essence of what it means to be human, and then who seeks to understand what those significant things are for humankind. All right, so I'd like to break this down just a little bit further to try and make it practical for your life, give you an example that uh, will apply to you perhaps in your own personal situation. So when I'm in a physical classroom, a brick and mortar classroom, and I talk to my students about the sociological imagination, I try to do this by example. So let's imagine that we're all sitting in a classroom together and I ask you the following question. How many of you struggle to make ends meet month to month? I'm going to guess in the age of COVID that a lot of you would have your hands in the air right now. A lot of you would be nodding your head, yes, I struggle. And I'm also going to guess that based on having asked that question to classes over and over and over, semester to semester to semester, that a lot of my students struggle to make ends meet. So let's assume that more than half of you struggle to make ends meet, at least at some point during the year. You see this as your individual problem, and you probably also see it as being influenced by something you're doing or not doing, that impacts uh, the outcome of your situation. So perhaps you feel like you need to take a second job. Perhaps you have an addiction to shopping that you shouldn't have, uh, and maybe you're spending too much money, you're not staying on budget. Perhaps you live in a very expensive house. Perhaps you have a very expensive car. Maybe you've had a whole slew of tickets and your car insurance is very expensive. So whatever the situation is for you personally, you think of this as an individual circumstance, an individual issue. But when I look out at my classroom and I see so many students with their hands in the air, so many students telling me that they have to rob Peter to pay Paul every single month, I want to know more about that. And upon investigation, upon research, what I find is that most of my students are doing everything they can to keep their heads above water. Most of my students do attempt to live within a budget. Most attempt to save money if they can. Most of my students live in reasonable housing, have reasonable transportation, etc. Most of my students don't spend a whole lot of money on food. 
And so the question for me then becomes, what's going on in the structure that is contributing to this problem? So the sociological imagination allows me to get out of my own personal ideas and notions about a problem and instead look at it from a social standpoint. Once I can do that, I can stop identifying things in terms of individual shortcomings, and I can start looking at things in terms of being social problems. This doesn't excuse the individual. You still need to do whatever you can to try and be successful. But when so many people are struggling, I want to know what's going on in the structure. Because I'm a sociologist, I know that there's a connection between the everyday lives of individuals and the bigger social picture. So now my next question becomes, what can the structure of society do differently if the individuals I'm talking to are trying to do everything right? They're working hard. They're getting an education. They're trying to stick to a reasonable budget. They're not spending too much on food or entertainment or cars, things of that nature. What can a structure do to help that person out? This is what C. Wright Mills contributed to sociology encouraging us to view things from the perspective of other people and from the perspective of social problems rather than individual shortcomings. So I bet if I posed that question to all of you, what can the structure do differently? You can probably come up with a whole host of answers that could be helpful to a whole lot of people. Uh, we need to make education more affordable. We need to have a better understanding of how the housing market impacts individuals. And potentially we need to have more social welfare programs in place to help people who are trying to do the right thing every single day to lift themselves up out of this situation. You know, I don't know how many students I've had over the years who said to me, Dr. Marshall, I was doing every single thing right and then I got sick and I had to go to the ER and that set me back months having to pay off that bill. Or Dr. Marshall, I was on my way to work and I blew a tire on my car, didn't have a spare, lost my job because I couldn't get to work on time and couldn't fix my car. One thing snowballs right into another. C. Wright Mill's work allows us to see that sometimes the problems we have are structural. Sometimes we aren't the primary contributor to the problems that we have to experience every single day. I want to encourage you to use the sociological imagination every single day. Try to see things from someone else's perspective and it might just help you to understand their situation. All right, I hope this helps. We'll talk again soon. Take care.